Us, what's up? It's me back again, Analog Attack. Welcome to like a new series we're going to be doing about Iron Maiden. Chris Corey is going to be the co host, co captain for the whole series. 16 episodes, Chris, right? 16. Uh, that, that's what it's looking like, yeah. 16 episodes. So we're going to be looking at every single like, Iron Maiden studio album in detail. Straight um, on through. From, and we're, how are we going to do it though? We're not going to go in a chronological order right we've got we've got a certain style we're going to do it yeah well yeah. um if if we go i you know i think if we go chronologically mm. we'll be front loading so what we're going to do is uh we'll, we we'll do we'll start in 1980 with yeah. iron maiden and then we'll zip all the way to the end 2015's uh book of souls and then we'll go back to killers and yeah. then we'll keep going like this. Like so it's that. gonna and be this we'll end up, we meet in the, the middle. Final episode will be Fear, Fear of the dark. dark. There you go. So I'm excited about this. There's a lot to talk about. Let's dig deep into Iron Maiden. Uh so 1980. First album. Let's have a little look at it quickly. I'll show it. First LP. Uh matching. Very matching. nice. There you go. Oh, lovely stuff. Yeah. Uh we'll get into this a little bit more later. So 1980, what was going on in the world of heavy metal in 1980? Well, a lot was fucking going on in 1980, let me tell you. I think this, for me, this might be the year, the most interesting year in heavy metal. Well, you know what I did, Chris? I thought, let's have a little look what came out in 1980. And I, let's, I've i got a big big stack, actually. I'll go through them real quick. Yeah, let's see what you got. Right, uh, so Angel Witch, first LP, mm. classic, ACDC, Back in Black. Black Sabbath, Heaven and Hell, The Oyster Cult, Cultural Erectus, Budgie, it's not an album, but this came out in, in 1980 as well. Surafungal, Frost and uh. Fire, first LP, Diamond Head, Lighting to the Nations, Death Leopard, On Through the Night, Gillen, Glory Road, uh. Girl School, Demolition. Judas Priest, <laughs> British Steel, Motorhead, Ace of Spades. There she is. Ozzy Osbourne, Blizzard of Oz, Quartz, Son of a Fight, Saxon, Wheel of Steel, Saxon, Strong Arm of the Law. I was going to ask. <laughs> there you go. Samson, Head On. This is good. Yep. This is, you know, important record. There's a guy on here, right? Yeah. Come into play. Yeah, no, he's there. He's in here, all right. Tigers of Pantang, Wildcat, Witchwind, Give Him Hell, and interesting one, Wishbone Ash. Ah, uh, yeah. Testing. Obviously, big influence on Iron Maiden. So, man. relevant. And that is just the tip of the iceberg for 1918. So, I only brought a list, but. Um... All right. But a couple more that yeah, I would have brought most of the same records. Oh, yeah, yeah. A couple, a couple that didn't make it that I think are relevant. Uh, mm. White Snake, Ready and Willing. Yep. So that's yep. like sort of that's like the the Deep Purple uh, sort of revisited album. There you go. Yeah. And uh, oh, Van Halen, Women and Children First. That's right. Um, yeah. Uh, to me, like to me, 1980 in heavy metal. I mean, obviously, I was I was not there. I was not born until 1981. How, how many minus years were you? I minus one. <laughs> so I, uh. I, 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 this is disgusting, but I believe I was conceived in 1980 because I was born in June of 1981. So I wonder which one of these albums I just pulled out was the soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. I don't want to think about it any further, but um, yeah, yeah, but. Yeah. So a lot of those records are basically like blues rock records, right? Yeah. Um, a little bit heavier, you know, a little bit more raucous, but, you know, in the blues rock tradition. And then you've got a few that are sort of like the, the kind of cutting edge of the time, you know. Right. So obviously Van Halen, Women and Children yeah. first, and then Blizzard of Oz. I feel yeah. like those two sort of represent the California sound, right? It, or like the American, like the buildup of the American sound. Yep. Ace of Spades, obviously, that's like, you know, it's like a newer, heavier thing, but it's also like, you know, very sloppy compared to most of those, you know, which mm. is not, that's not a pejorative for me, but mm, yeah, um, but sort of like you get irrefutable. Um, yeah. 
I feel like when we look at it, when you look at the first Maiden LP, it's like it's sort of all those things and none of those things. Like mm. there's so, there's certain things on it that I just don't think anybody did before, and especially the way that they did it. Right. Um, you know, the, you mentioned Angel Witch, and that mm. was early on. They were considered like a front one front runner of the new wave of British heavy yeah. metal, along with Maiden. Uh, as well as Diamond Head, you know, yeah. um, Angel Witch got signed to, oh, they got signed to Bronze. Bronze. So there was a Bronze, showcase yeah. and yeah. some of the stuff I've read suggests that they couldn't really pull it off live as well as the record, um, which makes sense because the record is kind of ornate. Mm -hmm. Diamond Head got signed and kind of made a record that was a little too soulful, I think. Yeah. It didn't come out till a year or two later. Right. Uh, Def Leppard obviously had great success and yep. they, you know, um, and Saxon was sort of the other, the, sort of like those, that group of bands, maybe Samson in there, but, uh, sort of that first initial wave, which mm. is the best, the best part of the new wave of British heavy metal to me, maybe is that like really early, like, is it rock and roll or is it something else? Like, we're not really uh -huh. sure. And, you know, MCA did a deal with, like, neat records at that time. Like, right. there was a lot of major labels sniffing around. Yeah. Like, Pikes like, of Pantang were kind of yep. been hyped up quite We got um, White MCA. Spirit got White signed Spirit. off that. And Fist got a, at Gears. least one record distributed by MCA. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's, like, a lot of major label interest in these new bands. And funny thing is, when I was looking back at some Maiden interviews... Hmm. Those guys were talking about how rock was totally dead because of new wave and punk mm -hmm. and how they really hated the genres of punk and new wave because they felt like it had sort of like killed, you know, the sort of the seventies rock thing, you know, right. like the, the purple and Zeppelin and white snake and all that had sort of been uh, put to death because of that. And what was going on at, you know like the sound house which is uh yeah so it, it was like a disco right? mm, yeah yeah um where but where they played all these like new heavy metal singles and, and demo tapes that's right and um that was kind of like where the pendulum started to swing back and there was like this new movement of like new hard rock yeah which you know now we call the new wave of british heavy metal yeah. Um, and that's where like I Iron Maiden kind of cut their teeth in terms of popularity. That's right. And uh, I, they're just they're so different from all those bands to me, even like right off the bat. I, you know, they put out a 45 and 79. Yeah. Called the Soundhouse Tapes. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have it. Do you have even it? Have, I don't even have a bootleg of it. No. Um, so, the, yeah, it's good. Like the earliest the earliest like maiden recordings i have would be like from this the metal from metal others from others you know it's got the early version of sanctuary and rothschild on it right yeah yeah very cool and then i think this is the first 45 they did for a major label uh which is running free yeah. with burning ambition on the flip yeah. and they got signed to emi right um and they and you know, in pretty short order, they were putting out 45s to sort of build up to the first LP. That's right. Um, and they were also included on the Metal for Mothers compilation, which is, that's EMI, correct? That's right. Yep. EMI, yeah. major label. You know, mm -hmm. it's got it's got Angel Witch on it too. And Samson on it as well. One of the interesting things, I think Maiden's the only band with two songs on that compilation. You're absolutely right. And they're positioned very well. It's like maybe side, yeah. first side, first, first song. On side one and then the, right in the middle of side two, just before the Samson song. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh. yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, and that was, I I think I read some, Rod Smallwood, who's their manager to this day. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think pushed to get them side one, song one. Um, really? So, and and I, I think some of, they have, they have, good management you know like like right from the get-go getting yeah. them getting a band like iron maiden signed to emi retrospectively seems crazy right um you want to talk about who's in the band at this time yeah i was going to mention as we were going into just i was going to show this actually like obviously there's a lot of books out there as well but like for pre first album iron maiden 
history story. This is a great documentary. I That's think. a great documentary. And there's a great first LP and singles era set on there. It's actually a week before the first LP came out. That's filmed right. at the Ruskin Arms. That's and right. He, Paul Diano is such a Cockney accented like bloke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I can barely understand what he's saying. He, uh, his, really? his speech patterns <laughs> get better after that, but so, yeah, he's really he's to... difficult to understand. It's great. It's it's like yeah. it's such a good like raw example of like what they were all about at that yeah. time. So if anyone wants to sort of dig deep into this, is really good. I bring I pull this out like once a year and watch it. I bet you could find most of that uh, material on YouTube. That's you a great. But you know, yeah, that's the first disc. disc. Uh, the second disc has the documentary too, right? Which in interviews all the, they had so many members, right? Coming through. Yeah, the band before, all those guys before. Right, so which is A cool. bunch of people cycling through with uh, Steve Murray and, or Steve Harris Dave and Dave Murray <laughs> being Dave. kind of like the constants for a while. Yeah, yeah. And the guys that they settled on for sort of like the first, yeah. first LP and the 1980 mark of uh, Iron Maiden are, I actually one of these 12 inch singles I have has this cool little like infographic of who's in the band nice. on the back. Yeah, 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 cool. And uh so in addition to Dave Murray on guitar and Steve Harris on bass, you get Paul Diano on vocals, Dennis Stratton on second guitar, and Clive Burr on drums. And uh we'll lose one of those guys on each subsequent album. I know. Do we miss do we miss Clive Burr with Iron Maiden? I I mean He's got to be one of the greatest heavy metal drummers of all time. Yeah, he's like the, you know, the uh, filthy Phil, you know, it's like of, when, of once ornate. he was out, like, I mean, it's different, but like once he was out, then things were different, right? In the drum. Department. Yes, not necessarily worse, but mm. he brought something. I mean, he plays drums like almost nobody else. And one thing I read about mm. Clive Burr that yep. Paul Diano said is he... um he would not solidify his drum arrangements until he know, knew what the vocal arrangement was. Wow. And he would uh, work his drum arrangements around what the vocal was going to do on the track. Right. Um, amazing drum. <laughs> Rest in peace. I've seen him play live. We'll get to that in episode three. I but, can't uh, wait. Of course, Dennis him. Stratton also, he was the guy that left because he wanted to, he wasn't, he wasn't really into the heavy metal, was he? He wanted to do sort of more, more lightweight stuff. He was into soul and stuff. And then he formed another band, right? After he... Lionheart, I Lionheart, believe. Lionheart, that was it. Yeah, he wanted to do more like AOR kind of stuff, right? Funny thing is, all three of those guys left and joined more AOR bands. And I think we'll yeah. talk about that, all of those in the future, I, I think theoretically. It's, it's an important aspect to the band, though, that sensibility. Yeah, I agree. Like, mm, yeah. So let's have a look at the artwork. It's yeah. kind of... It's iconic in my, you know, in my opinion. It's Derek beautiful. Rick. That's so great, man. And yeah. you know, just the the airbrush work on here. It it's like uh, to me, it's underrated. You know, mm -hmm. like some people think it's too simple, but yeah, like looking at the detail in the clouds and stuff, it really it it holds up really well to it me. Does. It's it's beautiful, and then the back has that this is like you can see here this is like the really really early eddie proto yeah. eddie yeah yeah so you know we like the artwork looks great this you know for a young kid 12 13 years old really striking you know you see this in the record store it, you know you you're like were you about 12 13 years old when you saw this in the record store i was 13 years old yeah <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> 13 years old. Were you scared? Not, not scared, just, oh, I'm on this. We'll get to this a little bit. This, is, this wasn't actually the first Iron Maiden LP I bought. It was the second. But, I thought uh, so. Right? Okay. You know me well. You know me well. Okay. So we've got Paul Diano, Steve Harris, Dennis Stratton, Dave Murray, Clive Burr. Classic Derek Riggs artwork. What about the production on this record, Chris? What are we thinking? Will so Malone, this right? one, yeah, Will Malone, it's an oh. outlier because right. uh, there's really only like less, like maybe five engineers that have worked on Iron Maiden records and Will Malone right. just did this one. 
Yeah. And it's, it's much maligned and I think unfairly so. Um, a lot of people think it sounds too raw or too too uh, too thin, but it, it needs a little grit, especially yeah. on a first LP like this. And it's it's a gritty album. Like people think the guitars are kind of too buzzy or too trebly, but I I just think they sound great. I I, yeah. I know it it sounds like an independent production. So maybe, you know, on a label like EMI, they were like, Oh, this is it. But, mm. but it's, it's cool, man. It sounds cool. You feel, you feel that energy like, and, and I love, I love how direct it sounds. Mm. And that's like one of the defining characteristics of the early new wave of British heavy metal stuff is there's like, so many of those records are just dry, like mm. just, right off the floor in the studio kind right. of sound like a little bit crunchy, a little bit gritty, not a lot of like reverb and gating and I think kind of in a lot of ways. I yeah. The perfect. opposite. I played of this what morning. You... It just sounds timeless. You can't tell what year it is recorded. It just sounds timeless to me. It's I mean, it really sounds cool. You know, it's a, it sounds like they're working in a nice studio, but mm. they're just, you know, keeping it as simple as they possibly can. And that, that to me is actually like exquisite means and simple presentation. Yeah. Chris, one of the things that people say about the sound of this record or this early era, the the Paul Diano era really is that it's punky, you know, and as punks ourselves, I think we might have a a kind of, you know, a good perspective on this, you know, it's 1980. If people are saying it's punky, then who does it sound like? It, It doesn't sound like the Sex Pistols or any of that like 77 stuff. Um, it doesn't sound like, so like, h- here's the thing for me, you know, I, I was a punk, I, a metal guy first and I got into hardcore punk. So when I, like, when I like first heard like GBH and Discharge, to me, I was like, oh God, this kind of sounds like Motorhead and Tank a bit. I yeah. did not think at all, oh, this sounds like Iron Maiden. It doesn't, there's like no connection there at all. It sounds like Motorhead a bit and, and Tank, but like, so I'm not really sure where that, it's punky thing comes into why it, you know it's called i think so. we both know why we well i know i kind of know why and i know and, and like steve harris always says he hates punk and paul diana says like this is another, another thing paul diana often says i'm a punk when he's interviewed but i've never actually seen him talk about any punk bands that he likes i mean i might- believe i've heard him reference right. the stranglers there you go, there I, you, go. you know I, so from what I've read, and I did, I, I was saying to you off camera, Yeah, I read uh, Popoff, Martin Popoff has a pretty recent book on just the 80s era of right. May, and it's got a lot of primary source kind of interviews in it, and I'm pretty sure he says he was around at some of those gigs, and he was friends with some of the punks, and right. you know, skinhead type guy, you know, just kind of like, I, he he seems like a guy that would be hanging around with just you know general riffraff um and he dressed punk you know yeah, it, I, yeah. I think when you look at you know like dennis stratton in his like red you know uh white, like white, white frilly shirt white white fresh shirt and his red pants mm-hmm. and his his platforms mm-hmm. and then you look at paul diano and it's like two studded belts yeah, yeah. leather jacket with Short no hair. shirt under it Short his hair. hair is kind of like no nah. like that passes for punk in 19 especially in 1980 right for me like and, in respect this is like looks like a could be a like g like not gbh but it's like you know Eddie yeah but it could be punk. like one of those things on uh one of those lesser releases on clay or secret yeah, or sure right yeah uh, absolutely. you know and, and another thing i think paul was like the link to the audience and i think mm. so a lot of the kind of like uh you know just again, general riffraff uh, mm. that were at the show. Maybe they were punks. Maybe they were metalheads. Like uh, he was, t- he was like friendly with them, and he'd be down in the crowd afterwards. That's what I've heard. Um, right. Especially, you know, again, talking that early era. Like again, if you can find that show, it's it's April 1980 at the Ruskin Arms. Right. I think mm, yes, and yeah. and you really get a sense of that. Like you know, he's like talking with the crowd, and people are shouting things back. It's right. like. And I mean, that that's what we think of when we think of yeah. punk shows, I think, right? Yeah. And so I think it is that 
And then it's also, I think the other thing is the speed and the, mm. like the manic drumming. Okay. So obviously like I've never heard a punk band play a song like Transylvania, but, mm. and I've never heard, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say I've heard maybe like two or three punk drummers as yeah. good as Clive Burr, but the energy and the kind of like the manic speed and some of the, even some of the fills and just some of the insanity that he puts into songs like that, that there is like something punky about that. Yeah. And running free is um, sanctuary. I kind of, you could, you know, I would say burning ambition also, like you yeah. could. And, and you know, know, women off. in uniform, which we didn't know was a cover, obviously, when we were kids. Yeah. That's kind of punky too, I guess. But like, uh, yeah, I think there's something there. And I would actually say probably the presentation of the, mm. uh, the recording also, you All know, right. again, like the real buzzy guitars, the like very upfront and like tight sounding bass, you know, All so right. Like one thing you can say is Steve Harris doesn't play like a heavy metal guy, really. Mm. You know, he's not playing like Lemmy, but he's probably closer to like Glenn Matlock than Geezer Butler. Mm, interesting. Oh. Mm. Um, you know, and it's just it's like somewhere in there where I think you can say the first Iron Maiden album is not punk, but it's punky. Yeah, there you go. All right. Right. We've cleared that up. <laughs> yeah so we got to the bottom of that yeah, yeah, yeah. Saw it. we can move on so it's an eight track lp it is songs, except if you're a north american where you would have had sanctuary on side two did you know that i did know that um yeah. and i am a north american but mine doesn't have that um i have let's Jumping see pressing, same as the uk pressing same track list what i have here i've got my sanctuary 12 inch single yeah Oh, let's have, okay. Let's have a look a little look at the singles, and then we'll move on. Yeah, to the we can do that. Album. I've got "Running Free," nice twelve inch, and then oh, this is like the classic with Eddie. Like, is Eddie, it is that the one? Yeah, Eddie, with Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, Eddie killing Margaret Thatcher. That this is that's classic. Again, I and Eddie looks kind of punk here. Like this yeah. could be a GBH I've 45. Got, there you go. I've got another version of it. There you go. This is the one I have. Yeah, with there the live tracks. But yeah, Sanctuary, Prowler, Drifter. I've got the fire, Montrose cover. Yep. Yeah. What else do I have, man? I've, I've got... Do you have a women in uniform? There it is. <laughs> there we go. And then this has invasion to... on it too. That's another, just another great, right. uh, it's kind of a punker too. And then I've got this one, this live in Japan. Sanctuary, I don't have the opera, Drifter, Women in Uniform, four tracks. Three tracks recorded live at the Marquee in London, but only released in Japan. This That's right. So, and Greece. There you go. <laughs> so <laughs> let's get to the album, Chris. Eight songs. We kick off with Prowler. Still wow. What a... One of my favorite Iron Maiden songs. It's really good. And like can you imagine well you maybe can imagine hearing prowler in 1980 i, I can't remember it actually it was on tommy vance <sighs> yeah. i mean compared to anything else at the time like i i don't know i mean what we just talked about all the records even compared to like rapid fire judas priest mm, like yeah. there's just something different about that song and that that opening riff is really haunting like and i don't know it's like unique really unique there's something a little bit more evil about it. Yeah, and absolutely. then you just, there's all the timing changes that happen in that song and that just like thumping, driving, you yeah. know, Steve Harris bass. And yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously it's a classic. Like, what do you say about a song that's that good? Yeah. And then, you know, this is the, a little bit of a pet, a pet peeve I have with, certain albums by certain bands that rem rem remember tomorrow sorry remember tomorrow i think it's too soon it should have been it should have been the third or fourth song I, oh i'm glad i'm glad you agree with me i saw i'm god it's gonna he, here he goes again but it's like yeah it, the energy drops too quickly on it right it's a fantastic song it's, it's though a great song just the sequencing it should have been track three or track four i think the last song on side one would have been a good place for i think right that seems like about the right spot it yeah. one thing it runs on the Black Sabbath, the song formula. 
starts with the quiet verse and then yeah. builds up into the uh the big thing then you come back down then you yeah. go back up and then you do some other parts that are kind of sped up compared to the rest of the yeah. song yeah um and it is kind of a doomer it is um, which is rare in the catalog good point of, yeah of the irons that's a good point chris yeah but you know i just think the positioning of the track is a little off because it, then it goes back into running free arguably the punkiest song maybe would have made a great track too also it, would, it just right? it feels like it should have been the second song <laughs> just to keep the energy level up for you know a bit longer yeah but. um did you see that were you watching television when they did that on like top of the pops or anything i, I saw it yeah i'm not yeah i did yeah did it leave an impression or were you just yeah absolutely but i'm gonna get into that a little bit in episode okay. three okay all right yeah you save all that <laughs> i don't want to yeah i want to say everything in the first episode but yeah so i've got running free classic um, phantom of the opera what's what are your thoughts on well, Phantom of the Opera, like, I would say Phantom of the Opera is maybe not my favorite song no. on the album, but it's, it's, I think it's one of the most interesting mm. because even though, like I said, like who else was doing any of this right. at this time in 1980, Phantom of the Opera is, like, that is an insane track. It is, yeah. It, I mean, there's so much going on. It's so dense. There's timing changes. Yeah. The playing is really intricate. The solos are like really developed, but super musical. Mm. Uh, and I just like, what what can you possibly compare that to at the time? You know, and people are always like, well, you know, Steve, he likes his prog, prog rock. Prog, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. But <laughs> find me a yes uh, what, yeah, song yeah. that sounds like Fan in the Opera or even like a, you know, later day Wishbone Ash. There's, nothing comes close. No. It's such a unique sound that they have there and it, it just must have been like mind-boggling at the time yeah. to hear something like that and it's not sure it's like a solid like seven minute track yeah i mean i agree with everything you said about the song but i kind of find it a little bit of a tiring listen oh man a little bit it's a little bit like taxing and i say well, that. you know it is a workout it is a workout yeah which is funny. It's the first album, and I'm always already complaining about the songs being too long. But it's a classic song, obviously. But wait till you hear "Brave New World." <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get to that. But uh, and then side two, Transylvania, instrumental, quite brave, maybe. Long a bit, yeah. The first album. Um, there's a lot that happens in that instrumental, though. Very so very it's very it's very certainly very not very flippantly very applied. Um, and you know, I think. That song and Fan of the, of the Opera are both really long. Yeah. I do think they earn those lengths. They really show you a lot of a lot of stuff mm. in those songs. And so I can see where they especially compared to like when when we get to Killers, right, which is the songs are definitely more compact yeah. on the whole. Um but they really they do show you that prog side, but they show it to you in a way that like nobody really before or since right has been able to bring it. Um yeah. And you can hear the way that like those two songs in particular, I mean, you have to assume that guys like Metallica were listening to that and absorbing that into their own DNA right. and then doing stuff like, you know, Master of Puppets mm -hmm. later. Yeah. Because it's a similar kind of like, it's very, there's like a, a rawness and like a really hard edge element to it, but still like not just anybody can play those songs. Right. I mean, that's the, it's it's amazing that it's amazing that this record got made on EMI and promoted so heavily and did so well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, now, I think I know what you're going to say about the next song. Well, it's the it's the ballad, right? <laughs> Strange world. I don't yeah. I like it. I like Paul's vocal on it. It's good. Yeah. Um, one thing I will say, I don't mm. know if they needed remember tomorrow and strange world on the same record there you go strange world feels like feels like a b-side um a little bit a little bit and uh i mean we already went through the list but sanctuary invasion mm. women in uniform burning ambition yeah. like those are four killer tracks 
I wonder if the idea was this is going to be a band that we sell with the singles, especially to this crowd of young kids who are right. used to buying cheap 45s. Right. And so give them the really good tracks on the on the singles right. and right. some of the more lengthy tracks go on the album. Well, people always say that like the new wave of British heavy metal was like a single genre, not an album. I, I may have said that a few times oh, myself. People do say it, right? But you know, there's so many good albums too, right? But, uh... There are. I mean, there really are. I think, um, you know, and and not to take like "Strange World" is is a really good song, a good song. Um, yeah. especially like for being such a sort of conventional ballad. Yeah. Um, but there are times that I'm like, man, they like they could have put "Invasion" on this record. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't dislike it. It's dark. It's right. moody. I like the atmosphere, but yeah, as you say, I, we could have had invasion. Or... And then I think we end on a really high note, right? Track three. Yeah, they bring it back up for bring the it end. back up, right? Charlotte the Harlot, saucy number. <laughs> saucy number about a saucy lady. I, that's another one where just it's so melodic, it's so fast, yeah. it's so nimble, like in the way they play it. I just. I did like I'm still I'm still in disbelief just thinking about like in 1980 like yeah. that is a song that somebody wrote. It, yeah, I that's that's interesting. I as I said I played it. I I know this album by back to front obviously, but just played it this morning and I was thinking exactly the same thing. Going into that 1980 thing, you know. It's, it's so like, gutsy to yeah. do a record like that. I mean, cuz look at the other bands that that came out of the that came out of that first wave you know look at like i mean there's no question that diamond had compromised when they did borrowed time yeah uh there's no you know def leppard on through the night like it's still i would say that one's still new wave of british heavy metal but like they're already cleaning up their act at that yeah. point in 1980 you know um i mean the only thing you know really comes close and i i don't even think I, do you consider Motorhead a new wave of British heavy metal band? Wow, well, I, I, I don't spend really. A lot of time thinking about that, but um, not really. No, just I mean, not like Judas Priest. You know, they they go back much further. So yeah, it's and yeah. and even so, Motorhead's on an independent label. You know, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's I mean, not, obviously they were part of it just because they were playing with all those bands, obviously. Body. and they were embraced by that by that yeah. crowd and they predate they predate the start of new wave British animal. anyway but yeah shout out the harlot and then we've got we get the opportunity to say i am maiden by i am maiden from the album i am maiden, I am maiden. To, fin to finish off with right it's, which they still play in the set list pretty much every time every tour am i right i don't think they've that? ever stopped playing it i said that off the top of my head but i think it's true it's one of the songs they they always have to play right yeah i i mean it's a it's a staple it's an yeah. anthem and you know honestly one of the best songs they ever have written mm. you know it's not just that it bears their name it's that it it's a genuinely uh, great song and i again like it's <laughs> well for what it's insane to put that as the last song on the record but that shows that they are really like conscious of the uh, album and the way the album is built right and not just about scoring hits or looking for the single yeah i, I mean because you could put that side to song one you know right. so you have two songs one you know starting off either side that are yep. fit for radio play like Obviously, Transylvania is not getting played on the radio ever. No, right. Um, you know, but that that shows that there is like some kind of vision there, right? Right from the get go, and you know, they're not. I mean, this. Yeah, I'd say I don't think Iron Maiden really has ever uh, compromised their vision. Steve Harris, in particular, no, not at all. and that's pretty impressive for a band that is almost 50 years old yeah. at this point. i mean you know they've never pandered to trends or you know here like and that. there there's a little you mm -hmm. know they they make mm -hmm. some tweaks they make some changes but they pretty much stuck to their guns this whole yeah. time that is not something you can say about well 
maybe any of the other bands i think you could maybe make an argument for motorhead yeah. but yeah a few albums in there that uh yeah maybe they did a little so what, bit do we, want to, we, we want to talk about the tour like subsequent tour notes or what was happening there i think this is going to become more interesting oh, later go on right yeah because it'll we'll be talking about like which songs get cycled in and which songs get cycled out That's a good point. whereas yeah. um they I like all these songs got played live and, right. including the the tracks from the singles and a yeah. lot of these had already been staples from the previous lineups of the band right um yeah you know i think like like fan of the opera and uh remember tomorrow uh, some of those songs go back to like 76 77 right. yeah um but you know I'll, th- I'll take one more opportunity listen to check out that ruskin arm set yeah um, i mean there's a lot of really good material with Diano, and i think one thing it really shows is how like serious they were early yeah. on you know that they were that good at pl- like they do not mess up on these songs live no um you know and like there's a lot of bands that that you think wouldn't and they do um so it yeah. it's it's no small feat right okay chris the time has come yeah. where well, we must rank this album how many eddies out of 10 are you going to award i am i'm going to i'm going to give this uh nine uh, decayed corpse heads mm-hmm. and then a uh, half of one with the brain spilling out so that's a nine right. and a half uh decaying corpse heads because even with a couple of small sequencing faults that we yeah. identified there's nothing like this album to this day this is one of the most innovative records ever made in rock and uh yeah it's 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 just a beautiful thing yeah me too i'm gonna give it a nine that minus one is just for the remember tomorrow positioning and a tiny bit for strange world which it's a good song but there could have been others on it all right there we are all right, we closed the book on the closed the book on the first album, 1980 Iron Maiden. Yeah, classic album. Thanks for tuning in. Next episode, we're going to tackle the book of souls. souls. Look forward to that. I'm excited about that. So until next time, stay.